Howdy, and welcome to the Petrus Development Show, where we discuss fundraising in the religious sector and how generosity and giving impacts both the organization and the donor. From campus ministries to high schools, from universities and faith-based nonprofits to Catholic parishes, we bring you stories, insights, and best practices that will inspire, educate, and inform you to go out and raise more money for your ministry and the kingdom. God bless, and thank you for joining us today. Well, howdy, everyone, and welcome to the Petrus Development Show. My name is Ren Hain from Petrus, and I am joined today again by the owner and president of Petrus, Mr. Andrew Robinson. Hello, Andrew. Thank you very much, Ren. And I'd just like to point out that you did open this episode with a howdy, and I'm very happy about that because this is not your normal <laughs> normal style of language to use howdy. Is. So it must be after so many years working together, there is some part of me that is rubbing off on you, which is good. It definitely rubs off. And after 130 something episodes of the show, <laughs> uh, it's, it feels wrong. I felt wrong the last couple of times to not start it with a, well, howdy everyone. So yeah, I thought right. I'd give it a shot and see how it, how it felt. Yeah. Well, good. No, I appreciate that. Uh, one of my favorite things when I am talking to a group that maybe I know, maybe I don't know, is I like to start off a lot of times with a introduction and a howdy, everyone. And then everyone says, right, they look at me and then I say, wait, wait, wait. OK, we have a tradition at A&M <laughs> where, where I am in alma, uh, is my alma mater, which incidentally, I'm wearing my A&M uh, gear today. But we have a tradition where when you're speaking to a group of people, whether it's one person, which I guess is not a group technically, one person or whether it's 100 people, if you say howdy, their proper response back is howdy. And so it works really well for quieting a crowd before you talk or make an announcement is you can just yell howdy. And then half the room will say howdy. And then the other half will say, wait, what's going on? And then you say howdy. And then all, everybody responds howdy. And then all of a sudden, boom, you've got everybody's attention. So it is a very helpful, um, what would that be called? It wouldn't be a mnemonic, but a helpful device for uh, quieting a crowd when it's time to talk. That's excellent. The, the longer we've worked together, the more I've picked up in all these customs around Texas A&M, which definitely of any <laughs> university I've ever been around has its own culture. That's uh -huh. the most distinctive I've ever seen. Uh, there, You've told me there's there's even certain salutations depending on when you graduated compared to somebody else and all these different traditions. Yes, we are. We are not short on traditions at Texas A&M and it doesn't take much effort to even create new traditions um, because we, we have so many that it's kind of like, well, that started somehow. Well, let's start a new one. Okay. I, we've done this twice together. Let's call it a tradition. Great. Perfect. All right. We're all happy. Moving on. Excellent. This is a lot of fun. Yeah. All right. Well, let's transition into our, look at that segue. Let's transition into our, our, our subject for the day. Well, I uh, think which... this is a good transition because you're talking about traditions at A&M and how I live and breathe and pass on the traditions that I have experienced. And we're talking today about leaning into your strengths, right? Utilizing what you know. And that's what I know is traditions and traditions at A&M. And I'm not afraid to pass those along to other people and use them to my advantage, clearly. Excellent. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about that. Uh, we wanted to talk about a different, not so much of a nuts and bolts topic today, right? Uh, we get asked all the time or people tell us all the time, oh, I'm not the right personality to be, to be going out doing fundraising, right? You got to find somebody who's better suited. Somebody who's very extroverted, uh, very straightforward, who's going to go out there and just knock down doors and shake people upside down and take their money. Uh, right. And that's not necessarily how it actually works in the real world with fundraising. So I want to talk a little bit about personality styles and, and finding your strengths with your own personality, uh, within your own personality style, and maybe identifying weaknesses so that you can complement them within your team with other people that have strengths in those areas. Sounds Some, like a great discussion. Excellent. Well, let's get into it then. So a few years ago uh, at the uh, Petrus Development Conference, as it was called at the time, Petrus Leadership Conference at the time in Oklahoma City, we had a speaker named Guy Malibone, who is a well-known fundraiser in Canada. And he gave a little talk about personality styles. And he started by having every person in the room go to a different corner of the room based on what tool they identified with without giving us any information about 
what that what each tool meant or why you would identify with them. But he said, all right, you're either a hammer, a measuring tape, a screwdriver, or a saw. Pick whichever corner corresponds to each of those that you feel like represents you. And then he he did this excellent talk breaking down over time. And once we kind of figured out, okay, I personally went to the measuring tape corner and <laughs> I hope we, you know, we got to talking to the others in that corner. Oh, you know, why did you come to this corner and discussing why we felt like we identified as a measuring tape and each of the other corresponding corners did as well. Then he kind of broke it down and showed us kind of why, how we view ourselves and our personality, how, what we're comfortable with, with our personality and how we approach things and, and how that, maps to our strengths and weaknesses within fundraising uh, do you, maybe we should break that down a little bit um sure. can you tell us what what he meant by say a hammer to, and talking about personality styles sure so um you can kind of start to uh intuit what some of these tools might mean in terms of personality right so a hammer typically is going to be a very you, you see a problem you have a solution and that is to hit it really hard right so um really uh, assertive personalities would kind of fall into this hammer category. Um, people who have one tool in the tool belt and it's always a hammer, right? That, uh, yeah. you know, that's going to fall into this personality. Um, but it is very, you know, kind of a, an assertive, I see a problem, I'm going to fix a problem kind of personality, which is great. Um, so from a fundraising standpoint, that's that can be helpful because it means that you see a problem and you know what the solution is. It's to go and ask somebody for money or it's to ask it for a gift or uh, it's to, you know, be assertive and to be bold, which is great. Um, so that is a hammer personality. It can get you in a little bit of trouble because you have one solution to every problem. <laughs> and sometimes fundraising requires kind of nuanced uh, solutions and strategies. And when you have one tool in your tool belt and it's to hit things really hard, that can sometimes get you into trouble. But it is a good personality for fundraising because you're pretty fearless and willing to kind of dive in and solve a problem, however, uh, whatever it needs to be. And how about the measuring tape? Okay, measuring tape would be the opposite side. So I, I think that it's perfect that you identified with the measuring tape because measuring tape personalities are typically people who they want to analyze things and get to understand what the problem is and understand what kind of all the different solutions or strategies might be before really jumping in and solving something. So a lot of time spent doing research, a lot of time spent doing, um, you know, analysis, um, looking at, you know, compare, com uh, comparing this problem versus that problem. And this solution was tried that time. And what would be the solution this time? So in, in a, a wood shop, which I do a lot of woodworking, uh, you know, I use my tape measure just enough to, <laughs> to figure out, you know, if I'm cutting things the right way or if I, uh, you know, to get my measurements, but I, I will admit, I don't use my measuring tape enough um and sometimes it gets me in trouble and sometimes you know i measure it and i say oh good and then i cut it and then it doesn't match up perfectly and i think what the heck happened i measured it and then i go and i realize oh my measuring tape was actually kind of the end was hung up on something so um using your being in that measuring tape personality it's someone who is very um analytical and wanting to kind of understand something before taking action so but from a fundraising standpoint there's a very clear connection to fundraisers who you're comfortable studying data you're comfortable um you know kind of looking at problems and identifying problems and coming up with multiple strategies for how to solve the problems uh, which is good so when you do jump in and take action you know exactly what you're going to get because you've assessed the problem uh, on the flip side uh, tape measures can sometimes get hung up with inaction, um, right? It's kind of that rule of, you know, the the perfect answer is whatever you're going to take action and do, right? Um, yeah. Whereas sometimes you get sort of analysis by par or paralysis by analysis, you get stuck saying, here's all the possible solutions, which one do I need to choose? Otherwise, I'm going to regret my decision later on. Exactly. The adage is measure twice, cut once. Uh, if you're a measuring tape, the, the danger can be measure three or four or eight or 10 times. <laughs> yeah. Be really, really sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, as a measuring tape, it's, it's very attractive to think of working with a hammer, yeah. find the right solution and send them to go knock it out of the park, right? There you go. Uh, excellent. So how about the moving on to the next personality type, the screwdriver? 
Okay, so uh, hammer and um, tape measure are pretty clear, right? You've got kind of two ends of the spectrum in terms of personality, really assertive and really cautious, um, you know, with the hammer and the tape measure. Screwdriver and saw, they kind of live in the middle. Um, But you think of a screwdriver as somebody who is um, kind of willing to take action, but they don't need to, they don't need to hit it hard the first time right? You're, you are kind of more willing and able to, um, work through a problem slowly to identify kind of how to move forward, um, test out your, your strategies. And if they don't work, you can back it out. You can try something else. Um, but a screwdriver is somebody who's kind of very comfortable with, um, flexibility and assessing the situation and moving forward as you, uh, you know, as it works or, uh, you know, as it, you think it's going to work out, right? Um, from a fundraising standpoint, um, you know, screwdrivers often are comfortable living in both worlds, right? The analysis, I can try something. If it doesn't work, I can test it and I can back out. Um, but they're not stuck always in the perfect solution um, and never moving forward because you are willing to take action. On the flip side, kind of the downside of screwdriver is that sometimes they don't spend enough time in the data or they don't spend enough time with analysis. And then on the other side, they're not as assertive and bold. And, um, you know, sometimes, you know, you spend too much time kind of trying something and retrying it, trying something and retrying it versus just go forward, get it done, get off your to-do list and move on. So I think from a screwdriver uh, standpoint, it's it's kind of a blending of the two. They live in the middle. Um, and I would say probably most people, most fundraisers are going to identify with the screwdriver personality because you're flexible enough to, to try and, and retry, but you're not getting stuck, never taking action. And then how about the saw? Ooh, the saw is an interesting one. So there's a lot of analogies with a saw. Uh, and, um, you know, a saw is somebody who can see a problem. They can use that that analysis mind of the, uh, uh, um, the analysis kind of part of their brain to assist the problem. Um, and you can almost kind of slice a big problem up into smaller pieces that are manageable, right? So you have a big capital campaign and you think, gosh, we can't raise $10 million. Say, okay, well, what if we just focused on raising the first $2 million, right? That'd be slice off a part of the problem, focus on that. Um, it also means though that, you know, kind of another, you know, analogy to saws is once you, you will assess the situation. Um, you will kind of, uh, you know, think of possible solutions. But then once you decide, hey, this is the path. Boom, cut. You can't re. You can't uncut something. Um, so it is a personality that is, hey, I'm I'm willing to assess, but once I make a decision, I'm committed to that decision, and I'm going to live with the with the um, results in the end. So from a fundraising standpoint, you know, we kind of already talked about the capital campaign idea, but. It also applies to um, you know your year end appeal. All right, who's going to sign it? Are we going to have our chaplain sign it? Are we going to have a student sign it? Are we going to have um, you know the board member sign it? Um, all right, this is what we would see. You know, these are the the um, possible responses if we choose that. I'm going to go. We're going to go with board member. Boom, done. Let's move on. So um, it kind of applies. It, it gives you a sense of kind of looking at the situation and not analyzing it, making a decision, moving forward, and then being happy with the results. Which of those four did you fall into? Oh, gosh. I think I'm usually the, it depends on kind of the, the mood I'm feeling right mm-hmm. then. I'm definitely not the hammer, and I'm definitely not the, the tape measure. So <clears throat> I think it actually probably has to do with what uh, project I'm currently working on back in my shop <laughs> of whether <laughs> I'm, you know, I've been cutting more or I've been assembling more. Um, but I'm definitely in the screwdriver or the saw category. I'm probably closer to the saw because... I do feel like, and this is something that I've grown into. I wasn't always this way, certainly. Um, But, you know, uh, you have to analyze the situation. You have to think creative creatively what are my solutions but then once you make a solution boom i'm done i'm not going to go back and second guess myself maybe uh, i uh, cut something a little too short and um, that's going to be a problem but uh, i can't add it back so we're going to have to find another solution at that time it's not a kind of you know i'm going to I'm going to, I'm going to screw it in. And if I don't like it, I'm going to back it out and retry it. No, it's, you make a decision and then you live with the results. So I'd probably say saw most of the time. From the outside, that's the one that I would have guessed you would fall into. Yeah. But this is a kind of self-identification tool, right? You kind of put yourself in your own category. This conference is well worth the entire experience, especially for the faithful looking to build the body of Christ. 
That's what one ministry director said after attending the Petrus Development's Rays Conference in 2023. A fundraising staff member from a different organization had this to say, I have several years of experience fundraising and I found the conference applicable to me. I also saw new to fundraising people getting a lot out of it too. There is literally something for everyone here. In 2024, Rays, the Catholic Fundraising Conference, will be even bigger and even better. Join us on the Riverwalk in San Antonio, Texas, June 24 through 26, 2024. Rays 24 will feature outstanding speakers, great networking opportunities, and an authentically Catholic conference experience. Registration is open now. Learn more at PetrusDevelopment.com slash Rays24. That's PetrusDevelopment.com slash Rays24. I think it'd be worth some time looking at one that's got a little more kind of scientific research behind it, a different personality test. Um, that'd be the Myers Briggs, yeah, right. And and the Myers Briggs uh, breaks up into essentially four categories. Some places do five, uh, and there's a lot of and each category has kind of two options: you either this or that, right, right uh, within that category. And and it's it's your tendencies. It doesn't define you. It's not like you're always this way or 100 percent this way, uh, but it's your tendency is to be this way or to be that way. Uh, and, and there's a lot of science behind it. And what I would recommend doing so we we use a website called 16 personalities.com. It's, yep. it, it's um, you go and you can take a free the free test there. It's a Myers Briggs esque test. Uh, it's got the same kind of categories in there. And when you when you take that test, the important thing is to answer the way that you naturally feel like you'd answer not the way you feel like you ought to to answer mm, right there's yeah. no right answer so you're just trying to get a sense of yourself and and once you once you do the test it spits out your results there's 16 different options with uh, you know four times uh four categories and two options in each one and then they all mix up and as you read the description of your kind of personality you'll find out a lot of things about yourself that you knew to be true and then just kind of <laughs> open your eyes it's a pretty interesting process mm-hmm so let's dive in. I want to just touch on each of the four categories and the two options without going too deep into any of these. And we can talk about how they how they might apply to a fundraiser in, the, in their work, especially. Um, I think we're working with lots of different students in our boat course and our annual manual. This is something that comes up kind of regularly. And so it's interesting to, to think about, to, to play some uh, mental games with, with these personalities and how you can apply them to your fundraising. So the first category is introverted versus extroverted. This is probably the most commonly familiar of the categories for most right. people <clears throat> and it's it's it defines your energy and how you interact with your surroundings so introverts uh, prefer solitary activities they get exhausted by social interaction and they're sensitive to external stimulation whereas extroverts prefer group activities they get energized by social interaction and they're more enthusiastic and more easily excited and i think that what you're talking about is the the right way to think of introverted versus extroverted it's not what are you willing to do or what are you unwilling to do which is how a lot of people think of introverts versus extroverts right um uh, kind of introvert you know i i i live kind of close to the middle but i'm definitely um i lean on the the e the intro, the extroverted side of life so that means, so, you know, if I said, if I go out and tell people, oh, I'm an extroverted and I tested E on the Myers Bridge, people would say, oh yeah, well, that means you love talking to people and you love being around people and you hate being by yourself and you hate silence. And it's kind of like, well, no, that doesn't necessarily mean that that's my, the only thing that I can, you know, find uh, energy or, or, you know, appreciate, but it's where do I find my energy? So um, when I am around other people, then it, it kind of, it does energize me. It gives me excitement. I, I don't have social anxiety uh, when I'm with a group of people. And whenever I f- kind of finish a group, I'm, uh, you know, group setting or a party or something like that, I might be tired, but I'm excited and I'm kind of amped up, right? Um, introverted doesn't mean that you can't go talk to people, right? Uh, you know, y- you would probably say, Ren, that you are very close, very high on the the I scale, correct? On almost every category, I'm I'm kind of in the middle. Introverted when I took the test came out 100% introverted, <laughs> okay, and yeah. I don't so, think that's a mistake. I think that is right. pretty correct. <laughs> right, but that doesn't mean that you can't talk to people or you can't interact. You know, at a party or at a, a fundraising event or at a wedding. It just means that that is at the end of that event. That's very draining for you, and right. not in like a you know I'm I'm just exhausted from a day. But it's like I've put all my energy into interacting with people and um it was great i enjoyed it while i was there but gosh i am really drained my wife is very high i don't think she'd be 100 but she's definitely like 
85 to 90 on the introverted. And so, you know, between the two of us, um, you know, if we're trying to figure out kind of what we're going to do, you know, on a date night, I might say, Hey, let's go bowling because, um, you know, there'd be a lot of people around. There's a lot of, uh, you know, energy, a lot of excitement. We can invite some friends, we can uh, do that. And she's kind of like, well, that'd be fun. But what if we just went to a movie, just you and me? So, um, you know, it's not that they can't do, you can't do one or the other. It's that what does, where do you kind of find your energy? And then on, on the flip side, right. So I would say that I'm extroverted, but gosh, if I get on an airplane, I do not want to, you know, strike up a conversation with my airplane neighbor and talk for two hours. I want to put in my AirPods. I want to listen to a book, um, pull out my laptop uh, and kind of have that quiet time because that, you know, that that's what I want to do on an airplane or, you know, in other settings, I'm fine kind of being alone and, and finding that quiet space. But that doesn't mean that, you know, that that doesn't mean that. Um, or, or you wouldn't say, well, you're not allowed to do that, or that doesn't bring you joy because you're extrovert. No, that's just some, you know, you can do both. It's just, sometimes you feel more comfortable, comfortable because you're more energized afterwards. Exactly. And this is probably the, the topic within this broader personality topics that I had the most conversations with others about <clears throat> is yeah. can I be a successful fundraiser if I'm an introvert, right? And I did this for a bunch of years, a very, very high introvert doing fundraising. And what I found is I just had to kind of build some introvert time into my schedule. So if I was out meeting donors all day, I would have four or five meetings in the day, and but I would build in time. Okay, between this meeting and this meeting, I'm going to stop at this park and go for a walk by myself for half an hour and just be alone and recharge. Or at a conference, say in the middle of the day, I'm probably going back to my room for a little while just to get away from all the people. Right. Yeah. Um, and there's certain situations one on one usually isn't a problem for me. But when you get into bigger groups, it's like, ah, oh, that it gets a little bit overwhelming. So I got to build in some some time to recharge. Well, this is also a kind of to your point, Ren, um, finding finding your um, your partners in work um, and sort of balancing yourselves is also something where you can really utilize. You know, this is talking about using your strength. You can utilize your strengths in cooperation with other people on your team, right? So I know when you were fundraising with Father Ben, who would be very high on the extrovert scale, Definitely. right? So you can you can lean into your strengths as an introvert and, uh, you know, kind of focus on, um, you know, that, that, uh, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, you know, conversations or, um, you know, that, that time kind of in reflection and, know that father Ben is going to talk to the whole crowd, right? He's going to gather, you know, everybody and make sure that they're, uh, you know, he's got a story to tell. And then, but then, you know, you, you flip that. And when he doesn't feel as comfortable doing the one-on-one, -on -one, like you're ready to go and that's your strength, right? So it is, this is an area where having uh, an introverted personality and an extroverted, extroverted personality paired together as part of a development team, you can be really successful in fundraising. Exactly. One more point I wanted to make this, we're going to spend a little bit more time on this topic than the others, I think. Um, one thing that I learned is that in sales, introverts actually tend to perform a little better than extroverts, which is very counterintuitive. Uh, but the the reason why is that extroverts really lean into their charisma, their personality to, you know, when, in those conversations with, with prospects. Uh, introverts usually don't have that so much, and they tend to build a script and kind of a b test it one well you know one meeting after the next and that's definitely how i approach fundraising i had my basic script of i'm probably going to start with talking about these topics as we get warmed up i mean this is my transition into this topic this is my transition into making the ask this yeah. is my transition in, into closing up the meeting and those parts you know kind of became they got better and better as i tried them more and more and figured out what worked and i approached things that way as opposed to just going with the flow uh, and i think that did help me be more successful over time so that just can be one way that introverts can succeed is, is think about your your approach to a meeting build a script follow that script and it makes it a lot easier mentally for you than to rely on hoping hoping something interesting is going to come out of your mouth yeah and then when you're not kind of client facing or donor facing, um, right. You're comfortable kind of working on spreadsheets for you know half a day and kind of doing all of your, um, your donor research or, uh, cleaning up your database. Uh, that is a kind of a very tedious task because you're all alone. Um, you're just working through charts, but you're comfortable doing that. Whereas, you know, somebody who's highly extroverted and needs to be around people all the time, you put them in a room with a computer and say, you know, clean up this database for the next six hours and, you know, they're going to beat their heads against the wall. And so it is, it, you know, it's, you can lean into your strengths when you're interacting with donors, but then you can also really lean into your strength when you are doing, um, 
non-donor facing work that, you know, it, it does, it brings you energy, even if um, your, uh, you know, other people might say, well, this is, I can't really do this. Um, you know, I lose patience or I get too exhausted doing it by myself. Uh, you know, that is something that as an introverted personality, you can really lean into. 100%. All right, before we spend too much time on this topic, let's move on to the next kind of category of personalities. And that would be uh, known as observant versus intuitive, right? So each of these um, categories is, is represented by letters. So extrovert is E, introvert is I. So when you take the 16 personalities test, you're going to have an E or I for your first letter. Second letter is observant is S, intuitive is N. Mm -hmm. And so observant people tend to be practical, pragmatic, down to earth. They have strong habits and they tend to focus on what is happening or what has happened. Whereas intuitive people tend to be more imaginative, open-minded, curious. They prefer, they prefer novelty over stability and they tend to focus on hidden meanings and future possibilities. Mm -hmm. So within yeah, fundraising, so, oh, go ahead. So in a little bit, this is, you know, the next one is also kind of in this world as well, but it's almost kind of like the scientist versus the artist, right? Yeah. The scientist says, hey, here's, here's what I can see. Here's what I am observing. And I'm going to build a plan and a strategy around what, what that intuitive is. Here's what I'm seeing, but what does that mean? What's the, uh, you know, kind of what's the, the backstory behind that and how can I develop a strategy that is, you know, in inclusive of that, not saying one is better than the other, but, um, it certainly you know, as a scientist, you're going to be very, um, you know, focused on what you can see. These are the facts. And I'm going to develop a pragmatic and a practical plan, like you said, on that. Whereas, you know, intuitive, you're saying, all right, here's what I maybe you don't know, you don't analyze what you see as well. Um, but you can kind of paint a picture around that of well, what are the other, you know, sort of factors that I want to be aware of when I'm, you know, solving this problem. Exactly. Exactly. So within fundraising, uh, observing people tend to find it easier to create a system and to start executing it, keep executing it. They might be better at, they may focus more on their past results than on casting vision for the future. That's something to, to kind of watch out for or maybe avoid doing too much of. Uh, and they have to be aware of getting bogged down in the numbers and bogging other people down in the numbers, right? Because the Whereas numbers it, are really important to you, right? The facts, exactly. the data, that's really important to you. And that, you know, that's going to, that's going to jive with some of your donors, but it can also, you can take that too far and just rely only on, here's the facts of our organization. Here's what our, uh, what our ministry has accomplished um, from a number standpoint without really looking at the, um, you know, the, the greater impact that those numbers, the story that no, those numbers tell. Exactly. And then intuitive people, more of those artists, artistic people uh, in general, they tend to be looking for the next new thing. Uh, they, so they have to be aware of that, not being just focusing on the next new thing and, and avoiding doing their kind of present duties and executing the system. Uh, but they can be really great at vision casting. Mm hmm. You, you had an example that I really loved um, to kind of show the difference between these two. And the when you ask two people, one observant and one intuitive, to um, look out the window or look at a picture and, and recreate it, um, draw what you are seeing, then the observant per person will draw the, the frame, the picture frame or the window frame and everything that they literally see within that frame, right? Whereas the intuitive person, they won't draw the frame. They'll start with what they can see, and then they'll actually expand that vision beyond, um, you know, kind of show where the creek ends up and show, you know, the the height of the leaves on the tree versus just the the trunks. And so it's again, not one is better than the other, but it certainly that's a that's a clear way of thinking about it that that's helpful to me. Um, of you know, either I I tell you what I see exactly or I tell you what I see and the meaning of what I'm seeing as well. Exactly. You can see how these complement each other really well. If you can get both of these sides on a team, I think our our intuition is to say, oh, my way is the best way. People like me are the best. But if you get the opposite, you might get a little bit of, a little bit of friction because of that, but you're gonna get, get a better result, right? Uh, jumping into the third of the four categories here, thinking versus feeling. So thinking is T, feeling is F. Um, maybe this is a little more straightforward one, but thinking people tend to focus on objectivity and rationality. They prioritize logic over emotions. They tend to hide their feelings and they think tend to think that efficiency is more important than cooperation, whereas feeling people tend to be more sensitive and emotionally expressive. 
They're more empathetic, less competitive, and they focus on social harmony and cooperation. Mm -hmm. So there's a there's a really good book by um, Stanley, General Stanley McChrystal called Team of Teams, and he talks in that book a lot about effectiveness versus efficiency. And, and both are important, but if you are somebody who is more of a T, then efficiency is really important to you, right? Like I'm going to maximize my the return on the investment of time, energy, resources, whatever. Um, and I'm going to make sure that things are running smoothly. And my plan is being followed to the T, which is, there's a lot of uh, value in that effectiveness, which is the sort of feeling side of things is, all right, well, is the plan working and uh, do I need to adjust to account for these other factors when I go off script? Um, and so you can see kind of, uh, you know, back to that I and E, you know, you make a script or you kind of go with the flow a little bit is like that in this, um, in these two letters as well is do I, do I follow my plan because it's the most efficient or do I come up with a kind of a loose plan and modify based on that because it might be more effective in the end? Exactly. So yeah, with it, with for thinkers, um, they are focused on getting the following the plan, getting the job done, but they can maybe steamroll some people on the way, you know, on the way through there, right? They might risk you know, upsetting a donor. <clears throat> the feelers uh, are more likely to be in tune with their donor's feelings within a fundraising setting, uh, but they also might be more hesitant to say, maybe make an ask because they feel like, oh, it might upset, you know, the harmony within this relationship. Right. Uh, so you kind of yeah. need a balance of both there, I think. Yeah. And I think that, you know, going back to our kind of analogy of a hammer um, as a tool and some of the other tools, right? So I know it's easy to think, oh, you know, hammers are too assertive, too aggressive, and, um, you know, they're going to rub people the wrong way. Well, some of the best fundraisers I know are hammers because they focus on getting the job done. And, you know, there there might be some kind of, you, you know, uh, collateral damage or some carnage in their wake. But at the end of the day, they're going to be standing on top of the mountain and they've gotten there by brute force and brute strength. And not everybody can say that they got there, even if it was a, a calmer path. So in this thinking versus feeling, it doesn't mean that, uh, you know, that, that one, again, I keep saying this, not one is better than the other, especially in fundraising. Um, but when you are building a team of people, it's really helpful to think of, all right, this person, you know, I see how they are more of a focus on getting the job done. And this person is more of, well, I, you know, we'll get the job done if it doesn't hurt anybody's feelings. And it's important to have you know, a team makeup that incorporates of both of those personalities because you don't want to steamroll everybody and you don't want to stand by never taking action because you're afraid of uh, of hurting feelings exactly <clears throat> and then the final category is judging which is represented by a j or prospecting which is represented by a p and i think the myers briggs specifically uses a different word for prospecting i think it's perceiving off the top of my head uh, but it's j versus p and the j's are tend to be decisive thorough highly organized um that they value clarity, predictability, closure, and they prefer structure and planning over spontaneity. Whereas the P's are good at improvising and spotting opportunities. They tend to be flexible and relaxed. They prefer keeping options open. I think the, maybe the most accurate thing I've ever heard about this is if you go open the sock drawer of a J, you're going to find a whole bunch of socks folded and organized. <laughs> if you go find the sock drawer of a P, it's going to be just a pile of all the different socks. <laughs> and usually those two people marry each other is, is what I've found and heard from others. So. That's funny. Are you ready to unlock transformational growth for your organization? It's time to grow your mission to new heights and make a lasting impact. Picture this, building meaningful relationships with donor prospects and asking them for gifts that can truly multiply the impact of your mission. That's what Major Gift Fundraising is all about. Major Gift Fundraising is all about moving from transactional to relational with your organization's donors and supporters. It's time to put aside high effort, low return activities like bake sales and car washes. The organizations making the biggest waves are the ones building genuine connections with prospects and asking them for major gifts. But here's the thing, fundraising is both a science and an art. Relating to donors is where the art really comes into play. So many questions come up when you try to find the best approach for each donor. What's the right approach for this prospect? When should I ask for a gift? How much should I ask for? What project should I invite them to support? It can take years to master the art of building these crucial relationships with donors. But here's the good news. Working with a Petrus fundraising coach in our Major Gifts coaching program will shorten that learning curve and maximize your return. Here's what's included. Weekly check-ins. 
York Fundraising Coach will be by your side with weekly calls to answer your questions, strategize for donor meetings, and provide feedback on recent interactions. In-person coaching. Your coach will spend valuable time with you in person, whether at your headquarters or in the field. They'll accompany you on donor visits, offering personal feedback and coaching to supercharge your major gifts fundraising efforts. Course access. You'll have 24-7 on-demand access to the Petrus Boat and annual manual courses. These resources cover fundraising fundamentals and annual fund growth, giving you a solid foundation to build on. But don't just take our word for it. Listen to what Father Ben Haas, pastor of St. Albert the Great University Parish at Michigan Tech, had to say about Major Gifts Coaching. Since beginning Major Gift Coaching, we've seen substantial growth in overall giving, total donors, and total number of gifts. We built relationships with a new advisory council, hundreds of alumni, parents, and other supporters through face-to-face meetings. So, if you're listening to this and ready to take your organization to new heights, visit PetrusDevelopment.com slash Major Gifts today. Let's embark on this journey of transformational growth together. That's PetrusDevelopment.com slash Major Gifts. Yeah. And there's often, uh, you know, in, in, in all of these, right. If you are one, you know, you lean, you score higher in one, there's oftentimes a, um, a desire to think, oh gosh, you know, um, yeah, I'm a P, but gosh, it'd be really nice if my socks were really organized, right? Like it's, you know, I wish I could be more like that. And not to say that it's not uh, proper to kind of work on your, identify your weaknesses and, um, you know, kind of work to improve things that truly are holding you back. But um, it can be, you know, the other side of the fin, so to speak, can look a little bit more glamorous, um, especially when you're, you know, struggling. And the truth of the matter is you have to, we have these gifts that God has given us, and these are strengths that we need to utilize, even if there are times that we feel like these are weaknesses that are holding us back. So, uh, I would say that I'm a P and you know, I'm, uh, I prefer to keep options of everything you said. I, I like to be flexible. Uh, I, you know, I love to improvise and iterate. Um, but there are times that I think, gosh, you know, life would be a lot easier if I was just able to, you know, be more focused and, and, uh, orient my plan and develop more structure. But the truth of the matter is, is that there are a lot of things that I would do really poorly if I didn't have that P side of my personality. And so instead of wishing that I was always something else, uh, I tend to try to surround myself with people that address those weaknesses in a way that I can still kind of live, live that life of me in that high P or high uh, perceiving, but then also we have people that are that are organized that develop that structure that move us forward as a team in a way that um, that complements each other really well. Exactly. I am a very strong J myself. <clears throat> and having worked with, like you said, Father Ben for a lot of years, I was the director of the ministry I was working at. Uh, he definitely would would not hide from the fact that he is a strong P. The very opposite. Uh, and the, he had great strengths of just going with the flow through a meeting and kind of guiding a meeting into a good result. Uh, but I, he would usually lose track of the time. We quickly learned it was my my job and my strength to monitor where are we, you know, time-wise, get us to the next meeting on time. Uh, but if it was just me in a meeting, my, my tendency would be to say, oh, all right, we've all, gone through our 10 minutes of allotted small talk. Now I'm going to uh-huh. move on in one minute to the next topic, like very follow structured. And it's not always the best approach to a meeting. So I think having the two of us together was a really good compliment. Yeah. And that's the thing is, right. Like you don't have to, uh, and, and even your donors, right. Sometimes you're going to meet your donors and, you know, we're talking about kind of how to make a team perspective, uh, layout or, you know, kind of, cl- um, uh, grouping, but, you have to, it's helpful to kind of be able to know these things and identify what, where your donors fit. And so if you're meeting with somebody who is a high S for example, and um, you can identify that pretty quickly based on, you know, their work or just the conversation. Well, you can say, Hey, this is somebody that's really going to value the numbers that, that maybe, um, you know, I wouldn't present to somebody else who is a high in for intuitive. And so you can, not that you 
kind of become all things to all people, but you present your present your sort of story or you present your proposals in a way that speaks to their strengths as well. Um, and that's really just kind of being aware of what these these personality traits are is good for building a team and also good for interacting with your donors, with your vendors, with your partners in a way that you are speaking to them in a way that they are going to hear you and um, be be more inclined to listen um, to what you have to say. 100%. Yeah. I went through an MBA program a number of years ago. And at the, when we first started the program, we got put in teams of three and we were given, we had to take a personality test, Myers-Briggs, and then we were given a bunch of scenarios and had to write a paper. It ended up being an 80 page paper of, in this scenario, how is each person going to react based on their personality uh, mm -hmm. styles? And it was really annoying to do, but afterward we worked together for the rest of the MBA program and it helped us get out of a lot of fights and problems. Like, oh, you're just saying that because this is how you That's approach hilarious. the world based on your personality and it helped us become a really high functioning team because of that. So the more you can be aware of how others, uh, how the, how these all play together, um, it just helps everything. So I agree. I agree completely. Excellent. Well, we're out of time for today. A few announcements quick. We mentioned at the beginning of the show uh, the Petrus Development Conference in the past. It's now called RAISE, the Catholic Fundraising Conference. And RAISE 24 is coming up in just a few months at the end of June, June 24th through 26th, in San Antonio, Texas, right on the Riverwalk in the Hotel Contessa. I'm All looking right. forward Plenty to it. Plenty of people there are going to say howdy to you, Ren. In I case think a lot of them are. That is correct. <laughs> and I'm looking forward to that. Now I know how to respond. And so do all of our listeners. Respond with a good howdy. Uh, we have a promo going on for Raise right now. If you register before this Friday, February 23rd, using the promo code PETER, you'll get 10% off of registration. So we hope you'll join us. Go to PetrusDevelopment.com slash Raise24 and use the promo code PETER because it's this week is the Feast of the Chair of St. Peter. Awesome. Pretty exciting. Right on. And hopefully we'll see you there. If you have a question you would like to have asked and featured on an episode of the Petrus Development Show, send it into podcast at petrusdevelopment.com and we may discuss it. Awesome. It was a great, a great conversation, Ren. I enjoyed it. Yeah, thanks for joining us today, Andrew. We have a free guide available that looks at the different personality types according to the Myers-Briggs personality test and how to make the most of your fundraising based on your personality type. To access this guide, you can go to petrusdevelopment.com slash 137. That's petrusdevelopment.com slash 137 for that free download. I'm so glad that you could join us for this episode of the Petrus Development Show. Do you know anybody whose ministry needs to take their fundraising to the next level? Please pass along the show to them. And if you haven't already, take a minute and do three things. Subscribe to the podcast so you never miss an episode. If you like the show, give us a five-star rating and leave us a review. And check out our website, PetrusDevelopment.com. Your ministry and the kingdom need good people doing great development work. And your donors receive just as much benefit from giving as your organization does from receiving. And as it says in Luke 5, Cast your nets out into the deep. Be bold and the Lord will provide. God bless and we'll see you next time.